Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Uh, I welcome you, Martin, as every morning to our fourth day, uh, focusing on ecosystems. We have a special focus on ecosystems this year uh, because we have been involved uh, in the in the issues of urban development. So uh, we will hear different perspectives on the questions of the urban challenge, including smart cities, autonomous driving, uh, and then also human and environmental relationships. Uh, with our keynote speakers, and after our tea break, we will have a promising panel uh, that will connect practice and science as you have experienced the last three days in the topics government, economy and health. I'm very happy to welcome a man on the stage now that is shaping my beloved city. Although, uh, for the background, it is Dominic Weiss, who is the general manager of Tina Vienna, which is the smart city Vienna agency of the city of Vienna. Dominic, please. He will introduce us to the strategies, and I hope also the deployment of the strategies of the smart city Vienna, and what we think in Vienna is smart. <laughs> Even so, I have to confess, probably I'm a little bit stranger here in this group, and probably I'm just invited because um, I'm working for the city of Vienna as well. We are the host of this conference, so but, 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 thank you very much. Um, as working for the city of Vienna, I do feel honored that this conference is taking place in our beautiful city. Uh, I do hope you had some great days, but you look still quite fresh, so I think uh, the last four days uh, most hopefully they look quite good. Well, what I'm doing, smart city, hmm, I, I really thought about that in the last days, how our smart city approach fits to your system of science whatsoever. And, well, to be honest, I'm still not sure, but uh, I try. I mean, there are some points I just want to tell you, I just want to give you an impression of what we're doing, and then I, I have some thoughts where probably you can help me or you can help the city of Vienna. Um, smart city, you know, I try to be really quick and don't know what I need that much. That is good. Probably help me out. Now, this is always like, you know, you're talking about smart city and then the presentation is not working. <laughs> That's not my, my mistake. Laptop just broke down. by heart, so I don't need the slides. But you will get, I think probably you'll get this by email or later on. Um, no, I have place as well. Um, smart city. Well, you know, when smart city, when this smart city issue came up, it was about five years ago, um, we had no idea in the city of Vienna what smart city is. Um, smart city is probably kind of a buzzword which came up 2013, 2012, mainly 
uh, from the US coming, Silicon Valley, there were some journalists, they did some smart city rankings, and the smart city or the city of Vienna got ranked as a number one or as a number two as a smart city in the world. And I do really remember that our urban planning director he gave me a call and said, Well, you know, we are ranked as the smartest city in the world. And I asked him, Yeah, good, good. super, what is it? I said, Yeah, you have to tell me. And um, you know what we did? We called our colleagues in Berlin, I think there are some friends from Berlin over here, we called our colleagues from Berlin, we called our colleagues in Amsterdam, in Barcelona, we even called the European Commission, and yeah, we couldn't find the right answer. So, I just want to give you an impression, smart city is a buzzword, it's a word which is used and it's actually quite fine, and we use it probably in a very smart way, but at the end of the day, uh, it's not about the word itself, it's about our goals and our the things we do behind. And that's the reason why it's not about sustainability or it's, you can call it a sustainability city, resilient city, innovative city, smart city, it doesn't matter. I think every city has its local approach, every city has its local challenges. Many cities have challenges in common and the city of Vienna has chosen a very specific way in terms of smart city and I think our way, most likely, and that's what I do hope, fits perfectly to your society because our approach is a very, very holistic approach. It tries to combine a lot of different sectors. And that's the reason why I think it has to do something with uh, systemic science, something like that. Is it working now? Yeah. Let's keep that, you know that anyway. Um, before I come to the smart city, I just have to tell you a little bit about the, smart, about the city of Vienna because this is very, very important for us. Uh, Austria is a very federal, is a very strong federal state. That means we do have, even so we are a very tiny country, we have nine regions, and these nine regions, they are very powerful itself. And the city of Vienna is, some, is a special case, as we are a city and a region itself. And when it comes to issues like sustainability, linked like energy or mobility, of course it's obvious that these, these issues, they do not stop at our city border. But somehow they have to, because you see, this is actually our city borders, and we are surrounded by a different region, Lower Austria, and they have just different legislation. I mean, it comes to well, what, what is your CO2 emission, what is your energy efficiency calculation, what is your renewable energy calculation, what about your traffic and your your, your mobility model split, and so on and so on. It's for us very tricky because. 700,000 people are daily coming from a different region to the city of Vienna to work here. And you know what? 80% of them are coming by private car using our road infrastructure. And they are actually, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it's a challenge. And that's somehow everything linked to a smart city. What else is very important? We are a very strong growing city. In 2015, the city of Vienna had growing about 40,000 people, 40,000 people in a year. Well, I do, I do know, you know, compared to Asian cities or Latin American cities, that's nothing. But you know what? The city of Vienna wants to offer the highest quality of living for every single inhabitant. And you want to do that, and you grow with 40,000 people per year, well, then it's a challenge, because then you have to offer quality places, kindergarten, school, road infrastructure, public transport systems, energy, health infrastructure, and so on. And that's the problem when you want to offer the highest quality of living in the world, because I do believe the city of Vienna is very famous for its quality of living, and that's that level we want to hold. Well, to sum it up, another last key aspect, 50% of our space is called green space, or well, probably blue space because the Danube is counted as well in. But this is actually a legislation done about 200 years ago. 50% of our area is green spaces, and we can't change that. And actually, we do, we do not want to change that. We're actually very proud of that. Um, but you know what? When you're growing with 40,000 people, and even old city like, like the city of Vienna is, well, then you get a serious problem, I would say, because you do, you just don't have space. So it's all about density, linked with, well, 
energy, mobility, CO2 emissions. So this is a little bit the starting point. Another starting point, yeah, our challenges. They're actually, I think, uh, I'm coming more or less to, to your thoughts or to your the things you do. Um, I said urbanization is a challenge. We are a growing city. Um, urbanization is there. It's the center of cities probably. It's, it's happening. Digitalization, it's, it's, it's really nice for my generation actually. It's, it's, uh, I'm very happy with digitalization. But for a city like Vienna, we have about 40,000 civil servants and we used to do our stuff the last hundreds and hundreds of years. Digitalization is something totally new. It, it just, the old system just breaks down because now everything goes faster and it's just a challenge. I don't have to tell you what digitalization is, it's just happening. Well, the last big issue here is globalization. I don't know, globalization is something like, yeah, yeah, globalization, we know that. It's actually, it's, it's used for me, it's always used in the 60s. I'm totally aware of that. And actually, you're a perfect example. I mean, coming from Australia, and it's, you know, you are a society coming from all over the world meeting here to discuss some problems. That's fair enough. But globalization is not just in theory happening, it's really happening in the city of Vienna every single day. And I give you a perfect example. When you turn on the TV and you see this very sad conflict in Syria, for example, they are, I know you are all very sad and you say, oh God, that's Syria, tragedy. But you know what we see? We had weeks and weeks where in the city of Vienna where about 10,000 refugees arrived in a single day, every single day at our train stations, 10,000 people. This is happening, this is globalization. When there is something going on in Syria, that means that 10,000 people arriving every single day in the city of Vienna in 2015. This is globalization. And actually as a city, working for the city, we have to handle that. I don't want to say that all these people stay in Austria, not at all. But the city of Vienna became a logistic hub. And, uh, well, it's about health, it's about mobility, it's about how to care about these people. And this is globalization. So, these are challenges, and these points, just mix it up, put it all together. It's probably the basis for smart city. Uh, well, not really. <laughs> um, because I'm coming back to 2014 when the city of Vienna got, so searching in the city of Vienna got ranked as the smartest city and our urban director called me like, what, what's, what, 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 what's going on now, what, what should we do? And after we talked to our colleagues in, in Europe and no, nobody ever gave, an, gave us an answer, actually we just were probably, we took the, the window of opportunity and were quite brave. Because what, what we did, we created a smart city strategy for the city of Vienna by our own. And my goal, my job was to do that. And I started with the, with the target of the CO2 emission. You know, there are European Union targets, EU 2020 goals, there are energy roadmaps, there are UN goals, and we have to fulfill that as a city of Vienna. So my job was, Dominic, okay, it's about CO2 emission. Uh, let's write a strategy about that. I mean, that was not that easy, and that was very easy because anyway, we have a department in the city of Vienna which is just doing CO2 emission. It's called a climate protection department. You know what? But uh, I figured out immediately, well, you know, when it's about climate protection, well, if you really want to have a success, you have to link it with many more issues, many more areas, many more departments. And I said, okay, well, actually, of course, it's about energy energy efficiency, it's about renewable energies, yeah, of course. So I went to the energy department, which was a success. But then the energy department said, well, you know what, of course, but you have to go to the mobility department because they are responsible. It's their fault that we use so much energy because of all the cars. So I went to the mobility department and said, okay, you have to come on board as well. We have to protect the climate, so it's up to you. And they said, yeah, it's up to us, but just 30%. Because the rest, you have to go to the building department because actually it's their fault. Because, you know, the old build, all these old buildings, they are the reason why we have so much CO2 emission. I went there and then I said, yeah, true, 30, 40%, it's our fault, but you know, 
what should we do, blah, 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 blah. You know, at the end of the day, there were about 200 people, about 25 different departments sitting together and like, okay, now we see somehow we all belong to each other. And I think this is what Smart City Vienna actually is. It's much more kind of governance change. It's about interconnectivity. It's about bringing all these different departments together and create something new. It's about breaking up, breaking up all these silos. I wouldn't say, and I, never, I would never say that all these people are doing a bad job. They're doing a perfect job. But the times are just changing. Urbanization, globalization, digitalization. It's just times are just changing rapidly. And that's the reason why a city government like the city of Vienna, which was doing a great job, look around. I mean, I hope you had some great days here. So as I'm pretty much sure the city of Vienna was always a very smart city. But you know, it's just times changing very fast. And the city government has to do something as well. So what we did, um, we brought together about 200 people for more than two years. We created a lot of new working groups. Um, with the power, we had the, our mayor in our back, he was very up to his topic, and we created this paper, the Smart City Framework paper. And well, this is just a short version, the long version is actually quite huge. And it's a framework paper, which is a guideline for our city for the next 50 years. And you know what? At the end of the day, we thought about, okay, what is the, what is the meta goal? Actually, what is, what is the goal for our smart city? And you know what? The mobility department says, well, of course, it's about mobility. It's about blah, blah, blah. The energy department says, no, 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 no. It's about energy. It's all about energy. And the climate protection, the climate protection department says, no, oh, come on. You know what? At the end of the day, it's about the climate. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's about the people. It's about the people. Just about the people. And there, coming back to what I said before, it's about the city of Vienna is responsible for citizens. They pay taxes, they pay my salary, and that's the reason why we, our job is to offer the highest quality of living. And that's what we're doing, and that's what Smart City Vienna is doing. That's the reason why we do know if you want to keep that, if you want to still offer the highest quality of living, we have to protect the resources, so we have to take care about energy efficiency, climate change, blah, 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 blah. And of course, we have to use new innovative tools, we have to use ICT, we have to use technique, we have to do public-private partnerships with innovative leaders, of course, and with the universities and with people like you, because it's not up to civil servants to, I don't know, create whatsoever. It's up to us to give the right framework. That's what we are doing, and that's what Smart City Vienna is doing. Well, and that's how it is, and I think there actually the city of Vienna is doing something special because if you go, I don't know, for example, to Barcelona and you ask people there, my colleagues there, uh, Barcelona, what are you doing in smart city? They say, well, you know, it's about this sensoric which you put in the floor that people can park their car easier and so on and so on. Fair enough. That's their way of a smart city. It's okay. Our approach is something different. But it's not about the word smart city. Probably, I don't know, when the government changes and in five years there's a new mayor or in a half a year there's a new mayor, I don't know, then probably it's not smart city anymore, then it's probably, as I said, resilient city or innovative city, but I don't care about the word itself. It's about what we want to do. So, I told you it's about mayor. Uh, it's actually everything I told you. So it's about what we have. Let's say it's, it's, we have, we, find about 10 different areas. It's coming from the, from, the, from the health area to the cultural area. Everything is linked to each other. And what we're doing is, of course, projects. And actually, this is that's where I'm an expert. So actually, I'm more the pragmatic operational guy. That's the reason why I said probably I'm a little bit stranger here in this group, because I think you more to think about what can be done. I try to do something. But my thoughts about uh, system science and I thought about what, what should I say when I'm coming here is everything I told you, probably, I hope you get the impression that it's, it's working out perfectly. Well, it's not. You know what? Because we are not there yet. Um, I do believe, at least my generation, uh, we do have a picture about how it can work. But we are far away of implementing this into real life. Because at the end of the day, as I said, a smart city or a smart project would actually just be smart, or is actually just smart if you really, um, if you really, if 
if you're able to really kind of bring different actors, uh, different issues and different departments together. And in real life, operational, that's very hard. Because, you know, nobody has ever done that. It's a totally new area. And for a city government, actually, it's a tough challenge. So we are trying it out in small, tiny pilot projects. We're bringing together old people, together with new innovative startups, with a lot of apps and iPads and sensoric. You know, I mean, you know this issue. It's not, we're not the first city who is doing that. But for us, it was very new to, to, to put 200 old, retired people together with this young startup community. And the, the job of the startup community, paid by the city of Vienna, was to give solutions to the old people. So they were doing just coding and sensoric, and you know. And now they, they, all these people they live in in flats who are totally spaced up with sensoric and iPads and iPhones and so on and so on. And probably all these old people are most likely they do not know how to handle that. So it's you know it's a process. But that's actually what we try to do in kind of smart city to try out something new and to bring new partners together where you probably wouldn't believe that actually this makes sense to bring them together. And I think this is actually, this, that's what I believe, that's what you're doing, to kind of bring new areas, different perspectives all together. And that's what the city of Vienna has to do. We have to do that. At least we have to do it if we want to kind of reach some potential. And my job is to do that. So that's the reason why I'm very much happy if you have ideas, like what can we do something like that. And now I'm working on a project where I try very hard, to, for example, to combine digitalization and climate change. Whatever that means, you know, there are different approaches to how you can actually start this problem. I can just say, well, you know, I'm counting all the energy which is used by all these ICT issues, but that's not what I want to do. I just want to, I want to do, I want to just try out how climate change and digitization somehow works together. Totally new area. 40,000 civil servants, no one, no one has an idea what we can do. Probably it's not, it's not their job to know that, it's your job to know, to know that. Yeah, that's the reason why I'm here, I can ask you. But anyway, so this is what we are doing. Um, um, it's very challenging. This paper here is this is actually my last minute anyway. I think perfect. This paper and I'll sum up with that is a set is a framework paper. It's about fifty five goals in year, and all these goals, of course, at the end of the day, it's a compromise. You know, the politicians has to sign that, and this is actually another big difference to other cities. This paper got signed by the city council of the city of Vienna. It's legislation. We have to do that. Go to Copenhagen. I'm sorry if some of Copenhagen is here. Um, but you know what Copenhagen is doing there today? They are saying, well, Smart City is about CO2 emission, and their goal is uh, we want to be CO2 free, CO2 neutral in 2025. And uh, it's such a joke. No city in the world can be CO2 neutral in 2025. That's just a marketing joke. It's embarrassing. But you know what? It's doesn't matter because this their paper is not signed by anyone. It's just written and it lies around and it's, it's it's nice to have, but they just don't have to fulfill it. We have to fulfill that because it's legislation. It's signed by the mayor, it's signed by the city council. And some of these goals, especially in the area which is somehow new, innovative, they are very much open. We just do not know, for example, what what's going on. I give you one example which is embarrassing as well. When we wrote that in 2013, it was about, okay, about this city apps. A city has to offer apps for an inhabitant, for its inhabitants, you know. And we were sitting there together with our ICT department, and at that time, just searching apps were somehow new for them. And I said, okay, well, our goal is in 2025, we want to have 100 apps linked with the city of Vienna in 2013. I think in 2015 we had about 1,000. So that's what's, you know, times just changing and it's just, as a city, as a big city, it's just very tricky and it's not that easy. But nevertheless, some of the goals here, they are very powerful, they are very tough. I'll give you an example, this is my last example, um, mobility. You know, 
my mobility, it's, it's real life. I mean, I do hope you're using the public transport system in the city of Vienna. It's a good public transport system. 30, 38% of all ways in our city are done by public transport system. And you know what? You can buy an annual ticket for 365 euro. That, I don't know how it's in London, 2,000 euro, something like that. So, you know, it's about we want to give an option for people to use the public transport system. Nevertheless, it's a fight between public transport system and private cars. It's not a fight between public transport system and bike, because biking is, is there, but we are not Amsterdam and we are not uh, cities in Belgium and in, in the Netherlands. So, it's, about, it's a fight about public car, private cars and public transport. We have a model split, and the model split says how ways are done of 27 percentage of private cars. 27 percentage. That's not that bad, but we could look out of the window, you, you saw it, you see the cars. And we don't want to have them. We just do not want to have them in our city center. The city center should be an area for its people. It should be public space where people just should walk around and use their time. So we want to reduce that. And you know, one goal in here is about, we want to reduce it down to 20% in 2025. So minus seven percentage of used public, private cars in the next eight years. And you know what? When someone is saying what smart city is everything and nothing, I'm telling him minus seven percentage of private cars in the next seven years. And you're telling me it's about everything and nothing. It's one of the toughest challenge ever. And we are working every single day in kind of reducing our private car use in the city of Vienna. And you know what? We just, just top down and bottom up. We do give options. We invest a lot in the public transport system. But on the other hand, of course, we make it very hard for people to park their cars in our city center. So, you know, that's kind of tragedy in each other. That's not smart city. Smart city would be if we kind of link car usage, sharing communities, renewable energy, autonomous driving. We hear about that today. Then it's getting smart city. We are not there yet, but we hope to be there once, and probably you can support us with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dominic Weiss. I, while, I was, while I was listening uh, to your talk, uh, and you started with, uh, you're not sure why you've been invited. <laughs> I know why. <laughs> Uh, because you are doing the work uh, uh, we are uh, looking at. Uh, especially in the last days, we had this topic of breaking up silos, connecting uh, government and structures that is an essential to actually uh, shape uh, future living spaces uh, quite often. And um, another thing, this is a story I need to tell you because I want to officially thank Dominic Weiss for. He's brave and he's really experimental and brave because we as the Breton Amphi Center have an uh, official partnership with the European Masters Program in Systems Dynamics and uh, one of their students came as a guest student to our center, Monika Bichler, she's also involved here in the team and uh, we asked Dominic if he could uh, connect us uh, with um, important uh, uh, decision makers uh, uh, in the questions of the master thesis and he gave us the opportunity to experiment with participative modeling uh, and uh, I thank you very much for uh, your fast <laughs> and helpful response. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is talking about um, the um, uh, autonomous uh, uh, vehicles uh, but from, as I understood it, a very critical point of view, because he's not only uh, from the Technology University of Vienna, but also working with the Department of Sociology at the Technology University. Um, and we are looking at, the, at one of the solutions that are currently trendy, but what happens if this trend really um, is going to happen in our cities? might have, have a huge influence than just on the efficiency and on the technology perspective. Please welcome Ian Banjari from the Technology University of Vienna.
really need the slides. I have dozens of them. <laughs> and he has to restart the computer. Anyway, uh, good morning. And um, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's really a privilege to speak in front of so many distinguished academics and professionals. Can you? Can you? Yeah. Um, the, um, my topic today is autonomous vehicles and their impact on cities of the future. And oh yeah, it's coming up. I am currently involved with a project called Avenue 21 which is um, uh, financed, funded by the Daimler uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, Foundation. <clears throat> and it's a small interdisciplinary team of, uh, <coughs> sorry, a team at the uh, Technical University at this uh, university. And uh, even though we are funded by the Daimler Stiftung, I can assure you that we are not selling Mercedes-Benz here. And we, in fact, we have the privilege to, at the end of the study, we can say that it's not a good idea, these autonomous vehicles. So um, that's assured. However, um, we have, and the project is, is, um, is it's a two-year project, and we, are, we have something like six, six months through. And uh, it, was a, it has been a very rewarding experience. and and. Um, I, I was, I, my, my background is urban, urban research and I've been looking into urban innovations in the last 20 years. So mobility was not really my focus. Um, but through this project I'm getting more and more into, this, in, into the subject and it's an absolutely fascinating thing that's, uh, that's happening right now. We are, we are our, our, our models, our paradigms of mobility are going to change dramatically in the next 20 years. And it's um, really, I'm trying to get more and more nervous that my slides are not going to come up. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, what is uh, maybe quite extraordinary uh, in, in the first phase of our, of our research is to, <laughs> is to see how this story of, of autonomous vehicles is unfolding around the world. And um, it's also interesting to see how uh, how how the I mean, the I mean there's incredible amount of research being being, uh, being done in the technology, but very very little on the about the impacts of, 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 of this technology on cities. So there are something like three or four four research projects now around the world, and we are one of them. Look at this uh, particular issue: how are they going to impact impact the cities? So. So, uh, so I have the feeling that people who are developing these technologies have actually very little understanding about mobility, about cities, about, about life in cities and so on. So there's a huge gap between those who are actually creating those technologies and those who will be using those technologies. And that field of tension, I guess, I mean, I mean I'm talking about autonomous vehicles now, but probably it's the case for any technologies too. I mean, people are, I mean, people are particularly the revolution is happening in Silicon Valley, and it's, I would say it's the epicenter of, of disruptions today, and um, and it's reaching out to every part of the world, and uh, and that is the that's the that's the thing that really fascinates me that how something like an autonomous car, which is technologically not fully uh, developed yet, and and the implications and the impacts are hardly researched and, and, and nobody really knows, and but. Despite that fact, it's a story which has been told with an enormous force, and it's going to happen. And that's that's a very interesting thing. So these are really master storytellers, who um, where the outcome is absolutely unknown. It's a story the end of which we do not know. And it's a real, really interesting exercise in in learning what storytelling is all about. So ah, uh, now I think that is not over. <coughs> So, um, um, uh, what, we, what we are doing, what I did so far, we have in, in our team, my responsibility is to look at the pioneering regions. Where is, uh, where are, in particular, where are governments, how and where governments are responding particularly responsibly and proactively to this impact of new technologies, in particular uh, autonomous vehicles. 
And um, so we have, so I have so far horizontally scanned the world and looking at where, where are things happening. And at certain points, uh, on, on you know, vertically going into um, zooming into certain regions with different focal points. So it's a horizontal and vertical approach. And I have so far come up with um, five regions, and myself, myself and our team, uh, five regions. Um, it's definitely the US, where the, which is which, is, which has Silicon Valley and a number of very proactive cities. Then we have um, Britain, England is, is, um, is very much at the forefront. Um, then we have Sweden, interestingly, with Volvo, with a very, very interesting relationship that they've built up with, with the country. Um, in Asia, we have Japan, and I think if the slides come up, I'll show you um, a slide how, how, how they have, they're creating a new type of governance around uh, autonomous vehicles. And, um, and Singapore. Singapore will probably be the most interesting example how, how a country and a city-state like Singapore is, uh, is, is responding very proactively to, um, to, the, to the challenge of implementing autonomous vehicles. Oh, fantastic. Should I work? Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, just this year. Let's see how this So just light down and no. Okay, so um so that's the that's um that's the that's the project at me twenty one. I'll I'll uh, I'll show you the Twitter account so you can follow us on, on, on Twitter. Um um, so I will talk about. Sorry, this okay. This is is that okay? Yeah. Um, so the 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 um, I have four, four four points: the rise of AV, the the discourse that's that's taking place around autonomous vehicles, um, how are the cities managing the transition and the impact on the cities, and um, and um, a last slide which is more about um, a question to you. Um, okay, so we have gone through that. Maybe just a little definition. What is an autonomous vehicle? Because there's no no, no shared um, definition. It's there, they're called driverless cars, self-driving cars, automated driving, and so on. So just one definition. Autonomous vehicles can drive itself from point A to point B with no manual input from the driver. The vehicle uses a combination of cameras, radar systems, sensors, and global positioning systems and so on. And at the end, mechatronic units and actuators allow the brain of the car to accelerate, brake, and steer as necessary. This is a very, very tricky point um, because um, with deep learning and machine learning, this is becoming a very serious issue. But we, that'll be the uh, last slide. So just talking about what um, um, the, the levels, there are, there are uh, five levels. What is, um, you can see what the blue part is is the bluer it is, the more autonomous the car is. So this is what the image shows. Um, masters of storytellers, Elon Musk is definitely one of the great masters. And the question, and that's the most fascinating thing that I find, is that this question is not about if it will come, but, but when it will come. The, the storytellers are less the industry, they're trying to catch up with the tech giants who are actually uh, uh, really at, at the forefront. Uh, consultancies, um, the media telling the, the stories through, through different channels, academia to a lesser degree, cities and states are under pressure to create, uh, to amplify those stories, and, um, and the finances, um, is, there are very few who, who, are, who are storytellers. The images that we have here are, are very, very different. It's definitely um, a question of experience of, of autonomous vehicles and um, this and cars in the future that have no drivers will become spaces of living and that's a very interesting thing for architects and, and, and planners. Um, this is uh, Volkswagen, so there are very different kinds of images that are coming up around, around autonomous vehicles. The media is talking about the most disruptive innovation ever, um, so they're um, adding up to the storytelling. So you have consultancies 
um, dozens of them. And what I've done, oh yeah, yes, and of course you probably know the uh, Gartner hype curve. And it's interesting that, that um, we can use the pointers. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I'm not, not touch the computer. <laughs> uh, we are over uh, a, I mean, the, the peak of the hype is, is over. So we are actually, you can see the red dot from the top. Um, so we are heading towards the trough of disillusionment, and that's when the serious work starts. And the message from Silicon Valley is very, very clear. Everything that moves will go autonomous. And this is not only about cars. This is about trucks, drones, toys, shipping carts, and, and many other things. And just to put um, autonomous vehicles in context, it's a part of a much, much larger digital transformation, as, as Dominic had mentioned before, which cities have to have the challenge to deal with its big data, its industry 4.0, connectivity, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, that's a huge big post humanism and transhumanism. So it's only a small part of a much, much, much bigger transformation. And it's going to hit us like a tsunami. I really like this image here. I don't know how many cities are prepared for that. Dominic, you have a big challenge there, I'm sure. Um, this currency flows challenge of government. So what I did was um, I went through uh, about 40 consultancy reports and looked at what they're talking about. And um, this is not a systemic diagram. I hope Nora, Nora Bates that is not watching. Forget those, um, those arrows. Um, these are just the, uh, the issues, uh, questions, and assumptions. <clears throat> and basically we have about uh, five fields. It's about mobility and urban planning. Uh, Government, the market, technology, human-machine interaction, and the defense circle is very small here, but probably that's the biggest one, but I don't know, there's little knowledge about what's going on over there. So just to have a brief look at what the, the topics, I mean the market definitely it's about, it's, it's a lot about money. So, um, so how much, how much, um, uh, how much will be saved, and there are numbers, um, I think I have one more slide which shows some of the numbers in, of, of, from the market. Um, uh, uh, governments, there's local governments, the city of Vienna will have to deal with that, but there's global government, governments, which is about standardization, um, uh, human machine, public acceptance is a huge issue because actually uh, it's, it's not a very attractive thing for people at the moment. They want to drive their cars and uh, but the young generation maybe are, uh, are, um, are, are more open to it. Uh, technology is not very clear. Is it going to be centralized database of, like Japan is, is, is um, making an incredibly high resolution map of every street and every highway, something like one million kilometers. And um, but the other model is that the cars will have their supercomputers at the back where they have their maps. So there are different models that are competing with each other. So you see a very, 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 very complex field with very, very different logics that are working and that not necessarily working with each other, but, but parallel to each other. So that's, that's the field that's, um, uh, that's developed. Now the pressure on government is a, is a very big picture. So ultimately it comes, to, it comes down to what, what the governments are doing. Um, I'll skip this uh, slide. However, it, maybe it's... Uh, um, the, the car industry is in, a, is in a crisis. We have reached, Austria has reached peak car by the way this year. They have sold less cars than last year. US, the EU, um, so the biggest car market is China. Uh, second biggest is India. And China is more or less dictating the, the, the global feed and they have, um, as you know, they have invested in, in e-mobility um, e and that's going to have a huge effect on on, on energy transition. So we have to really observe China very, very closely because they are the main actors at the moment. And if you look at the, the size of the market, uh, cars, um, the, the y-axis shows um, uh, uh, it's in billions, so 1.2 trillion dollars is the car market. And if you look at the number of phones that you sell, 1.75 uh, billion phones, which is about 400 million, and very few cars, will create much, much more uh, um, economic uh, value. So that's, it's a gigantic market, and that's probably the driving force at the back. It's not about creating uh, 
great mobility systems, but, um, but solving the crisis of the industry. Um, safety, well, this is an incredible number. Traffic accidents kill 1.24 million people per year and injures 15 million people. This is WHO data, it's an incredible number. And this is a, one of the uh, uh, main uh, points of the storytelling. Safe cost, this is another storyteller, uh, Morgan Stanley, this was a, a, a report in 2013 saying that autonomous cars could, uh, could achieve total savings of $1.3 trillion just in the US. So these are numbers which are putting pressure on the government. So on the one hand, we have the stagnating industry, um, the completely new mobility behaviors, and life is actually changing, as Dominic mentioned. Everything is changing, our lifestyles are changing, um, Virtual reality will change um, our, our, our lifestyle. So, so we have new mobility behaviors, then we have these huge global changes, climate change, urbanization, and so on, and then we have these waves of technological innovation. And that puts pressure on the government to take action. Some are reluctant and respond reluctantly, and some are proactive. And, and they have to create some kind of story of, uh, of the driverless city which is good for their city. So that's the pressure of the government. And in principle, it's about telling a compelling narrative about why we need EV, so the political imaginary is important, and then how do we manage the transition in a very complex multi-stakeholder process, and then anchoring EV in everyday life, because that's where it really comes down to at the end. Um, the knowledge is, it's a, it's a big question about, uh, so who, what kind of political knowledge is there? I mean, very few governments actually have the knowledge to, to respond to this, these massive changes. Now, the key issues in governance is, uh, is definitely uh, defining societal goals beyond market forces, because this is going to be uh, a difficult thing to, again, dominate uh, one of your big challenges. And one of the main things is maybe dealing with the uncertainties and keeping pace with technology um, is something which, which very, very few countries or cities are prepared with. Um, um, Carol Kokelman, um, an important figure in the whole discourse, says that um, uh, she talks about the heaven and hell scenario, and hell is very likely, and we'll see a lot more travel. So imagine if you can use a, um, your phone to get a driverless car, you would be able to use it. So if there's no regulation, we're going to have much, 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 much more traffic in the future. So it's going to become, the question is about regulation, regulation, regulation. Now, coming to, our, uh, to the impact on cities, um, when will AV count? This is a question which is often asked. And what is really interesting is that the first test of around AV was done in 1940s. So this idea has been there for a, for a long time. And it was only in 2000, uh, in Japan did the first, so 1977, which was the first autonomous car. Um, um, yeah, but 2000, but when it, it was actually 2010, probably you remember when, when Google car came up. That was when the autonomous car really hit the, uh, the public, the, um, 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 uh, uh, the, the medias, and we started to, Think about that. So it's not so long ago. And again, Morgan Stanley says something around 2026, 20, we're going to have um, the first cities which, is, which will be completely autonomous. It may happen a bit earlier in China, I think. Um, there is a very interesting. How many minutes do I have? <clears throat> There's an interesting curve. Um, I think it's quite a mysterious curve um, the curve of diffusion. These are, this is the diffusion of Cistercians, uh, Cistercian monasteries in Europe. Um, and this is the curve of resistance to technology as diffusion process. The number of threshing machines attacked during the captain swing movement in England in 18, uh, 1830. So you have the same curve. And um, the, so in, in, in interpreting it in a, with, with modern uh, terminology. So you have the innovators at the beginning, then you have early adopters, then you have the early majority and the late majority, um, and laggards who are, who are always behind. So um, this, is, this is the diffusion curve, which is very often used, and a tool which um, analyzes this, this transition 
It um, comes from um, a theory called transition theory, which was developed in, in Holland, which was supposed to help them steer the country into um, a sustainable energy. But it's, it's a model which is being used um, very broadly in very different sectors at the moment. So we are using the transition theory model. Uh, <coughs> I'll skip this, or maybe yeah, I'll skip this here. So what is transition? Transition can be described as a set of connected changes which reinforce each other but take place in different areas such as technology, the economy, institutions, behavior, culture, ecology, and belief systems. Um, so it's a very complex process taking place on many, many different levels. Um, transition theory grew out of evolutionary economics, science, STS studies, um, innovation studies, and systems theory. And it, basically has four phases. It has the phase of pre-development, takeoff, breakthrough, and, and stabilization. It's a very, very simplified curve. There are many small curves within, embedded within, and so on, because there are different systems that are acting in, as a, as a co-evolution. Co, co um, but also interesting to note that the formative phase of, of um, technologies in average is 22 years. So when we talk about disruption, we have to keep this at the back of our head. But it takes a long time until it really gets through all the regulations and, and becomes part of the uh, regime. Um, the, the, another model which is interesting to, uh, which helps us to understand this process is the multi-level perspective, also developed in, in Holland. Uh, it, looks, um, it has three um, and, uh, functional levels. Um, at the middle, we have the socio-technical regime, which reflects the dominant practices, rules, shared assumptions, regulations, stand standards, and so on. Um, and then we have the technological uh, niches. These are the places where innovations happen, like Silicon Valley or, or other places, um, and pushing into the uh, socio-technical regime. And at the top, you have the landscape, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, it's, a, it's a much bigger, um, um, uh, at some, on a bigger scale like climate change and or geopolitical change, resource depletion and so on. So, so landscape can act upon the socio-technical regime to act and on, on technological niches that are developing products to, um, let's say, producing less CO2 products that are uh, um, that produce less CO2, etc. So, so the transition management is about the niche regime dynamics, and this is where the, uh, the magic lies. So which cities are in which way cooperating with these niches to create a new technological regime. So, it can, so the, the, the speed of transition will depend on how governments um, are acting with these uh, niches. An example with Japan, how they have responded to it, we had this discussion yesterday. Um, they have um, created um, to break down the one thing they have realized that they have to break down the silos, and they have created a cross-sectoral um, platform called Cross Ministerial Strategic Innovation Program. And you can see this on the organic ground. You have um, the cabinet office of the prime minister, and then you have the four big ministries, and then you have the universities, um, research institutes, and the private sector. And, this, and, and the steering committee, which actually steers this new layer of institution cutting through the silos. It's a very, very interesting. And at the back, you have a large science and technology innovation program uh, with 10, 10 fields of, of, of um, core development areas. Um, so it's a very interesting model that they have, they have developed. I mean, cutting through silos is a, is a big issue. Come, uh, coming to the impact on cities, we, what we know by now is that a fundamentally new business ecosystem is emerging, that's for sure. How and, and where and who is not so sure. What, is, what makes it really difficult to, to uh, understand the effects is, um, has been formulated by a, a very extensive literature review by Milakis, Van Aram and Van Wee. Um, the, uh, they're talking about the first order, second order, and third order, order effects. First order is, is relatively easy, travel costs, road capacity, travel choices. Second order becomes a bit more difficult. Uh, vehicle ownership and sharing, how is that going to develop? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. We know sharing is going to become very big. Uh, but again, where and how and how much, we don't know. Location choices, 
Um, that will depend on how socioeconomic um, um, parameters are changing for, 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 for people. Uh, third order effects, energy consumption, air pollution, that's something we, at our public health, we, have, we don't know about. So it's extremely difficult to create scenarios because of these, um, uh, these effects which we don't know about. Uh, to break it down to, to, um, to on, 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 on the urban level, um, the, the, the use cases are, are, have, are being applied around the world now creating different uh, situations within the city and different uses like public rapid transit um, uh, or autonomous vehicle shuttles, then you have the pods and, or you have autonomous vehicle public buses you have, you have, or share or, 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 uh, or single or share taxis and so on. So there are different specific uses of EV, EV which are being tested around the world in, in different urban contexts. We have three, more or less three big pictures. It's um, the compact city, which, um, which um, Göteborg, for example, is, is, um, is pursuing. Then we have the polycentric city strategy, which is uh, London and, 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 and smaller towns that, uh, garden cities around London, and if there's no regulation, then we would have urban spots. So these are the three main big scenarios that are that that we see now. And this is a model of in in Melbourne. Um, uh, before the car, before cars came up, um, on the left, it's the walking city. The transit city expanded the the, the size of the city hugely. Then the Automobile city expanded the city even further, and the autonomous city will be even bigger. Then we have huge sprawl in case if, if it's not regulated. So, um, so this is a huge challenge for cities, I think. And um, yeah, I don't want to be in Dominic's position to tell the truth. Um, yeah, and then you have different images about how it could look like the uh, autonomous vehicles could have their own. Um, um, Lanes, uh, dedicated lanes. Yeah, um, yeah, there are you know images about very small specific areas how <clears throat> how it could be used and particularly how the interaction between the cars and 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 and, and uh, people walking on the streets would be very interesting to look at. This is Dragonless Philadelphia. Students are working on on, on various projects. This is Mercedes Benz. Uh, image of an Asian city, so you have to see the cars in very parked in various ways. Um, this is an European city. Singapore is probably, again, probably the most interesting story for me at the moment because it's the only city that has completely merged autonomous vehicles into the urban planning strategy. And what is also interesting is that you know they have a, they have a, uh, they have a pretty good public transport system, and they want to they're creating. They're rearranging their, their scenarios of their public transport systems with AV, and they are putting um, a lot of stress on, on active mobility. So it's going to be autonomous vehicles and people walking and people using um, um, bicycles. So it will be intermodal model, which um, so we have to look at what's happening in Singapore. So these are the images they have created. You see multiple layers and different types of autonomous vehicles. Sweden has, um, uh, it's, it's, it's not all about, it's not at all about driverless vehicles. This is a completely new approach to mobility. We're on the threshold of a radical shift and it's happening fast. And very interesting relationship between Volvo and, and, the, and, and, and the country. And also Volvo, the first car uh, industry, which says that they'll take full liability whenever one of our cars is in autonomous mode. So every accident, and, every, and they want to go absolutely accident-free by 2020 or even earlier. Um, UK, Milton Keynes, um, uh, again, there are, there, are, there are lots of experiments about how, how the public are responding to um, to these to these cars without without drivers. So in the future we'll have very different scenarios. They can be we can have huge sprawls. We can have polycentric models. We can have compact cities. We may have uh, zero emission cities, multimodal, which where there is literally no autonomous vehicles. It will all depend on what kind of governance 
um, are, is at, at the back. And so it's not going to be um, a matter of binary choices, but it's about a constructing melange of, of several visions. It's not, it's just not going to be black or white. And finally, um, the fuzzy bigger picture, and this would be my question to you now. Um, the European Union, European Parliament actually decided upon calling, the, calling robots electronic persons. This happened in, in January. And um, just to, to bring this back onto our minds, autonomous vehicles, just one part of this huge transformation where the question of human beings is going to become central. And what's so curious is that it's not going to be a few cars outside. It's going to be millions and millions of cars which are connected with each other globally. And we see um, uh, a displacement or a, a moving of our, our um, a displacement of human beings. So it's it's it'll be about more about cars than about human beings in the future of regulations. And of course, cars and human beings. So. So what is the question of what is human? What is the role of human in this completely different arena? It's going to be a thing that's going to be very, very important for us to understand. And finally, um, uh, this is in German, um, the lady is saying, stop, wait. And the man is saying, uh, where is it going to? Wo will es hin then? And the car has, you know, is gone, going off its own, and we don't know where it is going. And in fact, in, um, when there, there have been some accidents with autonomous vehicles where, uh, where it's almost impossible, it's not almost, it was not possible to trace back why these accidents happen, because it happens on, in, as you probably know much better than I, uh, artificial, uh, in deep learning, it's the complexity of, of, the, of the connections are, are so high that it's impossible to say how it happened. And that's a, that's a, and if you have uh, 10 million cars um, using that kind of intelligence, we would not really know what's going on outside. And I think that's why Nvidia a month ago came out with a chip where they um, where they are uh, they are saying that actually they can trace it, but I don't know if, how much we can believe Nvidia. Thank you for your attention. there is another issue of security and uh, that is uh, uh, food and nutrition security uh, it's about uh, what we actually can eat and will eat uh, and uh, I'm very happy to introduce to you Dr. Robert Taibon now my, today we have a problem with electronics you see that? Uh, from the Human Ecology Program, Venice School of Environment and Society. His talk will be on unraveling complexity, the role of low order systems dynamics models, and I'm very happy that he followed our invitation because next to socio ecological systems, which is one of my research areas, is human ecology. This area. And we also intended with this conference to bring these two communities together. And I also have to invite you after the lunch break. We will have an in-depth uh, further conversation uh, and we will look further into the opportunities we have to bring together human ecology community and the system science social ecological uh, research area. Thank you very much, Robert. So, uh, yep, <laughs> so just on technology, I thought uh, I'd be smart and bring 
my own laptop, I've got something going on, and of course technology upgrades means that the, uh, the port that connects this laptop to that machine doesn't actually, uh, doesn't actually work, so, uh, you know, technology is a wonderful thing that can get itself into, into some problematic places. So if I today's talk that I'm giving, uh, I've titled I'm having a complexity, a role for low order systems dynamics model, because I want to talk to you about how Cuny College has been trying to use uh, ideas stemming from uh, uh, systems thinking uh, in understanding uh, complex problems in general. At the end of this talk, I'll make some initial applications to food security issues, and then uh, I believe at one o'clock, uh, we'll, we'll pick this, uh, this topic up and explore more, more, uh, more deeply. So, um, just very briefly on, uh, on what human ecology uh, is, uh, that's where I'll start out, um, and then I'll, use, I'll talk about how we might get out of the conceptual swamp and suggest that uh, part of the problems that we, that we uh, face uh, are to do with the, mu the muggy thinking that's uh, going on, and I think this will tie up some of the talks that we've had this morning, so how do we put together uh, in the powerful, uh, robust ways that still allow freedom of, uh, of, of thinking and creativity, uh, and then introduce this idea that we're trying to use from the systems thinking area, a uh, feedback guided learning, which presents us with the potential for some simple yet powerful ideas that we can harness. Uh, and how this can move on to help us establish the kind of shared conceptual repertoire that we need uh, in uh, collaborative and collaboration in transdisciplinary groups uh, and, uh, and across knowledge boundaries, um, and, uh, and so thus allow us to co design. Uh, more desirable uh, uh, futures. Um, and then the case study of uh, food and nutrition security and conclude with some, uh, some comments and some, uh, some ways we might move forward. <clears throat> so the need for uh, comprehensive research uh, in human, human ecology has, ident has identified in other areas of, uh, in sustainability science we've spoken about uh, goes, uh, goes way back. And I'll just put this quite long quote from the founder of the Human Ecology Program at Australian National University, Stephen Boyd, now in relationship to the study of uh, Hong Kong that he did from the Human Ecology perspective back in the late 1970s. And he writes, The persistence of so many of the problems facing humankind in the modern world is to a large extent due to the excessive compartmentalization, fragmentation, and specialism. We need intellectual effort and improve knowledge and understanding of the patterns of interplay between different cultural and natural processes in human situations and of the principles relevant to this interplay. We use the word comprehensive to design work which has this objective. So that's very well and good, but the immediate problem that you then uh, uh, comes up for consideration is how uh, does this goal of comprehensive uh, work uh, not fall into the problematic uh, gap of trying to be some kind of science of all things, uh, a sort of other, you know, a sort of an anything goes approach? And so um, that's what I'll be talking about. Uh, and I'll use um, I'll use the uh, I'll use um, uh, food security as my examples. <coughs> Multitasking. Okay, so comprehensive uh, uh, understanding cannot be achieved by attempting to comprehend the behaviour of all the interacting parts in detail. There are too many elements, uh, and there are too many uh, specialised knowledge domains uh, uh, that work. So, in face of complexity, uh, decision makers and managers quite understandably. A retreat to polycentric management systems, snapping off parts of the problem, dealing with that part in isolation. We heard about this in the context of designing Smart Vienna. The problem with this is that in, in so doing, they're going to miss uh, those feedback interactions that uh, operate between the parts that they are managing and the parts that some manager in some other part of the, of the, uh, of the city is, is trying to manage. We, we, we were given the examples of, of trying to create a a carbon, a reduced carbon. Vienna, all the different management groups saying, well, we, you know, we're doing this and then, uh, that's not our problem, that's someone else's problem. How these things uh, in, interact and cross borders. 
So, if we start to think about food systems, uh, food as a, as, a, as a complex system, um, we might do, we might be able to do better at, uh, at trying to capture this cross sector, sector feedback behaviour uh, operating between these individual parts. So, within food system approach, food security is essentially an emergent property uh, of, of a, of a well-functioning food system. Um, a food system is or should be designed to regularly and reliably maintain at least minimum, minimally adequate food levels of appropriate food nutrition access for the members of the community uh, that that food system is designed to, to, uh, to, to serve to service. So, to try and uh, operationalise this, what human ecology uh, proposes uh, is, a, uh, is the, the, the work that low order systems dynamics um, uh, models uh, might be able to, to contribute to help uh, capture uh, the feedback dynamics operating within these complex systems. And the suggestion is, is it possible? And it's, uh, it's, it's tentative, but I'll give some examples. To decompose complex situations uh, into, a small, into the smallest number uh, of, um, of categories of variables that are, uh, that are at work in challenging uh, human environmental interacting systems. If we can do this, uh, uh, it enables a number of, of desirable outcomes. Um, the first challenge is whether we can decompose uh, a complex system and yet still retain its, its uh, underlying systemic structure. So by deliberately selecting the representative, uh, as few as, uh, as, as few as possible representative state uh, variables, potentially we can decompose uh, into, into a schema that is representative of that whole, that is simple enough to be comprehensible, yet retains the feedback structure that drives the changes in the values of those selected variables. Consequently, the decomposed system captures the essential aspects of the structure of the whole system and hence exhibits the characteristic dynamics of change that managers need to be concerned with. So the example here would be that the upper, the most uh, uh, conceptually uh, abstract level would be uh, the level of food security itself. You would then decompose down into, into kinds of food security challenges. For example, at a problem intermediate level uh, temp template structure, when you're looking at, for example, uh, small, the, the categories of smallholder uh, farmers in Southeast Asia, and then down to specific problem systems of interest such as an actual case study looking at, for example, um, the potential of jackfruit to escape commodity traps, a case studies from the Philippines. And then the reverse cycle is how you, would you abstract back up findings from a specific study back up to those more abstract levels uh, and thus enabling uh, cross-systemic learning. In many ways, we're going back to some older material that's, uh, that's informed human ecology from predecessors such as the work of, of uh, Rich Borden and the uh, Hawkesbury College of Agriculture. People in the room, such as Ray Eisen, recognize the, the Hawkesbury spiral here. Um, working, uh, uh, working from those reductionist science levels where the essential approach involves context fragmentation, Pure knowledge creating a discovery science, asking those all important what, what is questions, um, feeding on up through those technologies that arise out of that uh, in the form of applied sciences and professional consultancies, bringing those, uh, those sciences into play. Uh, those harder systems that, uh, that involve policy, formal institution decision making, perhaps simulation modelling, with an aim of optimising uh, and creating efficiency in, um, in, in, the, in the systems of, of, of interest. And at that top level, where the fundamental process involves context augmentation, bringing together knowledge from different parts, engaging the communities, knowledge synthesising, asking what values, what visions are going to take us forward, visions of um, 
worlds with autonomous cars. So I think it's going to be a long time before I'm going to go on a driving an autobahn a couple of hundred kilometers an hour facing backwards in the car. So I can't see that happening. But you know, is, what, what, what should be questions? Engage with the community to ask, what do we want? Can you give me that time? Through this, we face the challenge of de developing a shared conceptual repertoire. Because that process of knowledge augmentation necessarily requires a simplification of concepts. Because it's only at the level where we have simple everyday concepts that we can share understanding uh, across, uh, across our, uh, our knowledge domains that we can be uh, fairly confident that we can generate the necessary effective communication required for the co-production of knowledge and the collaborative development of policies. So at those highly abstracted technical situations, we're going to have very little, potentially very little uh, concepts in, in common. By bringing them together through less common situations where we have some, uh, some overlap between what each other is, are talking about, down to those simple everyday situations where we use concrete con concepts, will potentially create this overlap of understanding and capacity for communication. So, <clears throat> a starting point to actually operationalize this is to simply work with the communities of, uh, that, uh, of, who own the problem, or of, uh, who have uh, skin in the game, stakeholders in the problem, and simply go out to them and start asking them, well, what is the challenge? What do you see, is the, what, what do you see as, as the problem? So decomposing complex situations into a simple yet representative schema, problem managers can share knowledge about, uh, about interventions and solutions that appro appropriately distinguish between those elements that are unique to a specific food system context and those that derive from more common food system structures. Workshopping, uh, workshops guide stakeholders to work on self-diagnosing problem situations as they see them using such te techniques as mind mapping, rich picturing, brainstorming and other ways to get the communities to start laying out uh, what they think the challenge uh, is. They're given fairly basic instructions on doing causal, uh, in, uh, causal uh, loop, uh, cause and effect diagrams to help them retain the focus on relations and context. But at this early stage, it's really a question of trying to get their perception of the idea out and on the table. The process then help, moves them into a process of getting into focus. What actually, if you had to define, are the the actual set, the actual focus there. What is the key thing that this project, if it were to go ahead, uh, would seek to change? You would think uh, that well, that's been successful, and so they might have, might emerge the key focus variable they wanted to work on was level of food security, such that in some time in the future the level of food security had gone up and improved. The next stage they go through as individuals or in their, in their uh, homogenous groups is to start looking at a very small number of driver variables, affecting variables that will drive change in the, the key focus variable that, they, that they're interested in, and then in turn ask, and if that focus variable changes, what in turn will it change? The tease is to try and focus them on to are there then feedback loops that follow from uh, an effective variable and drive back to a driving variable, creating a feedback loop. And then spend some time doing this sort of thing. And when, when they've got their, their little diagrams up, the challenge that they then get given is to, to start to blend their diagrams with that of someone who's got a different perspective. Now, this pair bending uh, uh, approach simply is asking them to consider what is the implication of what you're trying to change for what I'm trying to change um, and vice versa. What, what is what I'm trying to change going to affect what you're trying to change? The challenge is that the blended diagrams they have to come up with cannot have more variables than the initial diagrams that they produced. And so, but yet still capture, cover what each individual diagram had been interested in. And this necessarily requires participants 
to relabel their variables in more generic terms to still capture the intent of their original more specific labels. The process is starting to produce shared understanding because the, the, the diagrams that they're working to come up with are simple enough to share the understandings of the behaviours of the different problem situations. And thus they can learn from each other about the successful interventions that change the system structure. So this example here is actually from Technology Choice and Population Health. One uh, group has come up with a mobility-based system of interest about car use and pollutions arising from car use and various outcomes, health outcomes from using cars. Another group is using an example from air conditioning usage and thermal stress. Now these are clearly uh, different, uh, uh, have different content and you wouldn't want to try and learn directly by, by knowledge transfer directly from what you did with cars to what you might do with air conditioning. By the process of abstracting up to a more generic global space, you can think about how learning from successful outcomes in one context perhaps can help successful outcomes in another. <clears throat> this is essentially opening up to the community questions about questions of the what if and what should be nature. Uh, rather than focus on what is currently the case. These are heuristic devices communities are producing uh, designed to reveal what is seen as the purpose of the food system and what beliefs legitimise that. What are the driving sets of values? And it invites discussion with those community members about what should be and where will those different beliefs lead us. So in this example, uh, this was, was what uh, a vision of food, uh, security that's um, achieved primarily through market availability, uh, would produce strong institutions promoting production and free trade, leading to access to processed food commodities and producing bulk, volumes of bulk commodity supplies. Within, within that worldview, that's what it would drive, those are the, tr the drivers of change versus a different view where food was viewed primarily uh, as a sovereign, um, as it, it, within a food sovereignty uh, lens uh, and with a focus on producer rights, which would lead to strengthening community access to local food and the health and benefits from ecosystem services and healthy agro-ecosystem uh, landscapes. Divisions are not supposed to be right or wrong, they're just where the different value sets take you and ultimately engage in judgment rationality, asking, well, what are or should these food systems for? What is their purpose and, and who designs? Are food systems a commodity or is food a right, for example? <coughs> the, the adaptive learning cycle then, once you've gone through a process of co-designing, will then lead to some uh, action information, implementation to produce change. Outcomes from that innovation then require further diagnosis against desired outcomes. Um, uh, de uh, decision makers across all scales are, um, are invited to bring in their knowledge sets to help uh, empower uh, the community or the group to produce the change and with the goal to produce uh, communities of practice that are capable of managing uh, their own uh, problem situations. So to finish with some case studies of us doing this, uh, I've been asked to give a couple. Uh, so one is working uh, with impoverished uh, farmers in, Philipp uh, in the Philippines, uh, trying to produce a, a food security, and increase their food security there. Uh, the, the overarching program uh, was uh, labelled ISARD, Integrative and Sustainable Agricultural Resource Group for Rural De Development. Uh, the communities are known to be uh, knowledge uh, and uh, financially poor, um, and the Philippine government has some pretty good intentions at the national level 
but struggles to deliver them down at the local level uh, and uh, production of large sums of, of uh, money to help uh, uh, bail farmers out is, is, is not feasible, there's just not the money. So the focus is on, is on social inclusion, the drivers they're trying to achieve are environmental sustainability uh, and get these cross-cutting concerns uh, recognised uh, using partic participatory approaches, working with farmers, working with problem holders, uh, getting them to understand uh, ecosystems uh, and how to enhance ecosystems using this systems-oriented uh, and transdisciplinary uh, approach. Uh, and then seeing how policymakers, businesses and farmers either see the problem situations in common or see them uh, differently. So here they are. They, uh, one of the things you can say is when you're working with the, the, the uh, poor farmers, rarely get asked what they think, uh, what they themselves want. They're normally told. Uh, and going out into communities and actually working with them, to um, actually working with them, they find highly liberating. They really get into into this. So um, uh, here they are, meaning uh, generating f future visioning. That they're, Create uh, all their little diagrams about what they what they want and what links to to what to, to whatever to whatever else. <clears throat> and the the farms themselves don't produce these diagrams. We take material from them and uh, and, and produce them uh, using the words and linkages they've identified. And so here you can see that the farmers are seeking institutional support to increase their own social capital and autonomy, whereas the government and policy decision makers, uh, outreach officers, think that what the farmers need is market access that will drive increased wealth. So immediately you see that the two groups um, are, are working across, um, are working with different goals, or seeing different means to achieve different goals. Quick look at food security in three capital cities, and we'll, this is the conversation will continue uh, this afternoon. Um, so the three capital cities were uh, the Australian capital region, Canberra, uh, Copenhagen in Denmark and Tokyo. And we mapped food productions across time um, <clears throat> against those cities and looked at the policy drivers behind changes in food production in the different cities. Um, the findings from this much higher order uh, project is that high urban population densities that consume in excess of their local ecosystem uh, capacity to service them, which is uh, Tokyo, require that their low population densities that consume less than their ecosystems can service and so produce food surpluses. The national policies of different, uh, the different nations reflect these realities of their own view of, of production nationality, but complex international flows make them co dependent. Uh, and these are the three, uh, the three um, uh, systems uh, are compared and contrasted. Um, and this, we'll talk more about this this afternoon. Um, but the, the fact remains that Japan's uh, food security depends on Australian policies continuing to yield food surpluses. So, uh, unraveling complexity uh, focuses on uh, internal feedback between sectors that are often seen as separate, e.g. relationship to urban planning, freeway construction, uh, urban sport and food production. It focuses attention on problem indicators such as declining food security as a symptom emerging from the food system structure. The focus is on changing processes, not just changing the current state of the system, and asking how the dynamics of the system cause change over time. We're looking to reveal common feedback structures that constrain the behaviour of systems. Changing structures change the behaviour. Uh, we're looking to identify what different people see as the system's goal or its purpose and why they think this is a good idea. And this sometimes catches out to who wins. Purpose to ask what is and what should be questions and the centrality of attitude and behaviour change to achieve just and sustainable uh, food. Uh, is, is uh, central. So I'll finish there. There's some uh, questions that we can ask about the decomposition. Decompos 
composability of complex systems can be captured at the end of just a few variables? And can we build low order models that demonstrate some of the fundamental behavior of complex systems? So I'll leave that there. Can you, can you please state your name, uh, okay. Dennis? Uh, Dennis Finlayson uh, from uh, England, uh, formerly Lincoln University, uh, Sheffield University. Um, when you're showing your diagram of up and down levels, the implication is that life becomes simpler when you get to the case study. But at this level, the uh, passive knowledge becomes much more important than explicit knowledge. So, how do you capture that and how do you distinguish? Uh, and the other thing is, do, do the people at the bottom ever get to see case studies of how things happen at the top? In other words, is there what we would call reciprocal outreach? People learn about the top and the bottom and vice versa. Yes, um, so the, within that diagram, the level at the top is working with communities to, uh, to surface that tacit uh, that tacit knowledge, uh, and in that particular version of the diagram, yes, you're drawing in uh, expert knowledge, as it were, from, from those lower levels. But the idea would be that that expert knowledge uh, is not in the form of uh, uh, dictating um, solutions, or but is much more of a uh, in the way of a, 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 a trial we invite in. A, uh, an expert uh, a, a witness to help explain what could be done uh, as, as a result. So in an ideal world, the uh, biologist would be in the field uh, hearing what the community's challenges were, what they wanted, and then, if you like, so let, suggesting some ways that they might, uh, that might help them uh, achieve some kind of outcome. So much more in a, in a partnership arrangement. Um, and then yes, the idea would also be that it's, that it's not always that uh, the knowledge required uh, isn't that, is, is, is an expert knowledge. It could very well be within the community uh, already. And the Philippine case study uh, specifically uh, looks for essentially experts within the farming communities, not from outside. What about the bottom learning about how the top comes? How the bottom comes up to the top? No, how does the bottom learn about how the top comes? Well, that's that's hard by participating in those. So we do we do a sort of form of a bio blitz where you get you get the you get experts in uh, uh, at little sort of stalls. The communities sort of come and up, interact with them. So in that sense, there's a much more potential for much more exchange between between the bottom and the top, uh, but it's a constant challenge to get, if you like, for the scientists to want to, to do that. I agree. That's what we're working on. Please. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Blackmore from uh, the Open University in the UK. Um, I come to this with a number of different perspectives. My husband's working in uh, using autonomous vehicles in agriculture, new smart machines, and um, my own interest is, uh, and it's a question to all three of you, um, what kind of system 
would enable the question of whose perspectives come to the fore to be addressed a bit more critically. I mean, I'm thinking of the way that you're saying it's more about cars and maybe a uh, car system driving the people, uh, or, or rather than the other way around. And uh, in your talk, Rob, about the involvement of stakeholders, and also your account, I mean, it could be of the um, uh, the way that you develop, you, you work with people in the end, which I thought was very inspiring. But I'd just like to know what sort of system would enable us to do this more critically, to get different, different perspectives to the fore. I, I did focus more on autonomous vehicles which are driving human beings. But I'm quite sure that much before human beings are driven by autonomous vehicles, it will be agriculture and completely different fields where, where, uh, which will come much faster. Simply because of the fact that regulation is, is much, much, much more stricter and liability issues are much, much more difficult to solve when human beings are involved. And it, um, there, is, there is not much, I mean, there's no hype at the moment around, around these other issues like agriculture or, or uh, um, implementing EVs in, in, in environments with, with hazardous um, uh, materials dealing with hazard or, or, um, or uh, cleaning, street cleaning machines. Singapore is doing a lot of that. So there's no hype around that we don't hear anything about. But I'm absolutely sure those are going to come much, much, much earlier than, than uh, autonomous vehicles driving human beings. It will depend on the countries, the specific needs of the countries. Uh, I Look, the only thing I can add is that the social, dimension of social power is incredibly difficult to negotiate. So in the Filipino context, um, what, what was quite evident was that the extension officers would have to roll out that uh, quite no um, integration policy themselves saw, them, saw themselves as being much more superior to the farmers with whom they were supposed to be engaging. And um, that's a deep sort of culturally ingrained thing. And how you work around it is all we could do was identify and report it back. This was going to be a major obstacle to achieving their quite, quite noble goals. Um, it's a diff very difficult issue. Yeah, I mean, I was expecting questions like this. But of course, it's a very, very tough one. I mean, which system needs to enable, like, be more critical in this way? Well, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I do or what, what, what civil servants offer. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. At the end of the day, in our city, the decisions are done by politicians. That's it. So we, we give options. In the area of autonomous driving, for example, we do give options to our politicians. And they make a decision. Their decision is always like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, they have their actions in their mind, and so on and so on. So we would need a system of knowledge, I think. It's a system where people just really are informed. At the end of the day, you can talk here for another ten weeks if you if you if you are not able you know to share your knowledge with the society and people and the students and all the people. Well, I can't do anything because my politicians at the end of the day just say, well, no, people just don't want that. Even we both know the politician and I that's the well, that's the wrong decision. But so I don't know it's. I think all the job is to kind of you know, to inform people, to bring them on board, to, to, to bring critical people on board, to bring young people on board, to bring a new generation on board. I always find myself in working groups with 20 men at the age of 60, something like that. These are the people who are taking the decisions in my city. And this has to be changed and uh, you have to bring in people from the Socialists, for example, and some of you actually, yes, I really liked your presentation because it was not about the technique itself. It's never about the technique. The te technique is boring. It's about social input. It's about how to bring that together. And this is actually probably the answer. We try, we try hard. And that's the reason actually why we don't do some stuff. Because it's not about the app number 420 on my 
iPhone, which nobody uses, but to do stuff, stuff which is necessary. But nevertheless, the gap is still there, and um, it's, I think there's not an easy answer, but we need a system where people have the right and people have a, a possibility to, to, to bring their own minds into the decision making process. And we are not there yet, not at all. Thank you. Uh, may we collect some questions because it's very time sensitive? Uh, Monica, uh, Elena, um, yes. Uh, start, Monica, please. Uh, my name is Monica. I'm a graduate student of the European Master Program of System Dynamics. Um, yeah, thank you very much for all your presentations. Um, I think my question relates the most to IPN. Um, I was wondering about two things. Uh, first, um, how do you think will the ethics be involved in this topic? Because who takes the responsibility for accidents when it's an autonomous car? And the second question is, you need a lot of data for doing all those things. Um, do you think um, companies who own those, these data collections will overtake the power in cities? Thank you very much. Okay. Before you answer, Ian, uh, I want to make the collection. We have ethics and data property. Elena, <coughs> your question. I wanted to ask about the impact of inequality of both economic status and infrastructure, road infrastructure, on areas that could not support public transport. Thank you. Sir, please. Uh, I would, uh, I'm Jeff Robbins, uh, teacher at Rutgers University. Uh, I'd like, like to address it relative to autonomous cars. Uh, basically, um, driving is a skill. And it's one skill amongst many skills, but it seems to me that as technology evolves, uh, more and more uh, we are losing the skills and, and also including the skill of attention. It showed in one of your slides, <coughs> lying back, you know, and, and losing a connection to the environment, which is really so. What is it in, in the context of technology more and more eliminating human, mental, physical, and social interaction? Uh, what is the impact of what happens to okay. So we have, I think, three questions now addressing autonomous vehicles, right? Uh, Felix? Can we have a microphone, please? Only a brief question uh, addressed to the representatives of the City of Vienna. Uh, do you, you didn't consider explicitly nutrition could you comment a little bit on, on this? Because the exciting thing from uh, 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 Dibel was the comparison of the sufficient food security uh, for urban regions, which is also interesting along with the global south. Mm -hmm. So we have one of the uh, questions regarding health, uh, food security, nutrition, city of Vienna. Any further? One I can take? Please. Can you? Hello, my name is Louis Gardner, studying in Hull, living in Edinburgh. And my question is quite broad in that we've, over the week, we've actually just, we've heard from people about climate change, we've heard words like sustainable technology, your question about the de-skilling of humanity, maybe we call it globalization, turning us into blobs. Um, so my question is, when we talk about sustainable technology and we, our solutions are to introduce more technology to solve the problems of the technology that is killing people, injuring people, de-skilling people, can technology ever be sustainable? Thank you very much for the collection. We make the closing round and start with Ian and come back to the city of Vienna. Ian, please, can you respond to the collection? Yeah, these are very difficult questions, and frankly speaking, I don't even know. However, uh, uh, the ethical question, maybe starting with you, the ethical question and uh, the question about who owns the data is, is definitely one of the key issues. And probably you know about this, uh, the ethical dilemma of the autonomous car. Uh, a car 
is um, driving, there is a child on the street, and there are four uh, members of the parliament sitting in the car, and the car has two options, uh, killing the child or or saving, uh, uh, killing the child and saving the four parliament, parliament of, uh, member of parliaments, or killing the four member of parliaments and saving the child. This is a dilemma which can, which the car cannot solve. It's, it's a social problem. It's a problem of social consensus. How are the rules being written, the regulation written by uh, globally? This is not a question of a sing single country's problem. So it's a complete, it's a very, very difficult question. And Germany has actually come up with, a, with an interesting, uh, not a manifesto, but a, but a, but a write-up, a green paper, a green paper about the problem. So Germany is very much at the forefront of, of, this, um, of this question. Uh, maybe you can Google that ethical question in Germany's feelings and surely come to that paper. That would be the answer to your question. Not answer the question, but where the discourse is at the moment. We are very much at the beginning. Uh, about inequality, um, and that's inequality. That's another, another big question. And if I think, if I contrast our time with, with the time of, of modernism in, in the 20s and 30s, it was a paradigm which, was, which envisioned infrastructure as something that's going to be for everyone, rolling it out for as many people as possible. But today, we have the situation um, through, through our, um, you can call it neoliberal policies, and privatization, that's not the case anymore. It's not the, the predominant idea is not to serve everyone, simply because the, the companies, or those, those um, industries that are serving um, mobility or other services have specific interests and specific interest groups. So that's a, there's a fundamental difference in our, in our basic approach towards creating infrastructure for everyone. And the city of Vienna is definitely in a, in a, is one of those good examples which still preserves the notion of serving everyone. Um, but again, if you, if you um, and Singapore maybe, even though there is, you have a very, very strong capitalistic approach there, they're still, um, they still have this approach of serving as many people as possible. But that's something we have to look at very, very carefully. Which industries is serving whom and, um, um, and in an equitable way. This question about skills, a um, set of skills that pe people need are, de depends on the age we are living. In the agricultural age, there was completely different sets of skills that people needed. In the, in the industrial age, very, very different. People working at the, at the conveyor belt with very, very different sets of skills. And in the age of knowledge or knowledge economy or the digital age, we have completely different skills that, uh, that are needed. So, the skill set shift, it's not that uh, driving may not be a skill which will be interesting in the future. People, our, our grandchildren may, or even our children may at some point say, driving, I mean, you know, that, that was a boring thing to do. And you do completely different things while sitting in this interesting space which is moving around the world. So, um, the, the bigger question is, of course, how to manage the transition. Because those people who are going to be obsolete in this time, how are you going to do? How are you going to deal with that? And, and Yuval um, Noah Harari calls this class the, the useless class. And as he also says, it's, uh, there, is, there is no economic model how to manage the useless class, which is to use millions and millions of jobs. Of course, there will be also millions of jobs being created, but that transition is going to be a very, very tricky um, question. I'll just say quickly on um, some brief response to technology. Um, it could be technology sort of agnostic. Um, all technology from a bow and arrow through to a space shuttle has a material and energy cost and affects the society that's, uh, that uh, deploys it in various ways for good and ill. However, you can have measures of, uh, of if you like, the cost, uh, and then you can ask more fundamental questions about uh, is the technology genuinely being applied to do something that increase, enhance the, the, the well-being of the, the people in the community, or has somehow the uh, machine got, the, uh, got, got ahead of the, the cart and, and we're now somehow creating efficient human units to sort of better process the technology? 
So I think those would be the questions about um, is the technology being employed to create uh, rich human lives, uh, worthwhile human futures, or are we just sort of slaves to a, a, a neatly functioning economy within which the, the technology is just the thing that we, uh, we, we, we buy and process, something like that. You, you, you raised the question about the data and big data issue. I think you, you forgot that. I, just a comment on, on, on what the city of Vienna, or at least what I do think about that. Yes, of course, owning data is a, is a big, big topic. And probably the city of Vienna is somehow very special, very special in that case, as the city of Vienna is owning its own infrastructure. So our energy provider and our mobility provider is actually owned by the city of Vienna, and we never actually privatized. That's the reason why we are totally aware that um, Owning data is necessary. That's the reason why the city of Vienna we we, we, we want to be a forerunner of our own, and we want to yeah. Next year actually there will be a bus running in in Lexel Aspern, which drive <coughs> drive autonom. Um, just two co more comments to to your issue, like uh, because I just have some thoughts about that. You know, I personally think we somehow have to ask. Just different questions, and that's what actually we are doing. Because at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves: Okay, in, in, in which kind of city we want to live in? And personally, I just don't care if this car is, is a fossil fuel car or it's an e car or it's an autonomous car, as long as there's a car. A car is a car is a car. It's always a car. And you know, I I do I do not see a proof that autonomous cars actually are really reducing the traffic. You know, the industry told us years ago, well, you know, with the car sharing system, there will be a reduction of the cars in your city. You know what? Actually, it's not that true. We have thousands of these car to go driving around our city, and at the end of the day, it's a really it's a rebound effect. It's used by People like me in the early 30s, which are rich enough to afford their own car, and when it's flexible and when it fits, I'm using the car to go as well. But it does not reduce a single car in our city. And autonomous driving is more than the same, and that's actually what I'm asking myself, or what the city of Vienna is asking itself. But it doesn't, when it's about the public transport, yes, it will be e cars, and it will be e mobility, and it will be whenever, but it will be autonomous, for sure. But I have no interest at all that there are autonomous cars driving around my city where people just relax and lay down because they are still using space. And this is probably, if there is proof that, of course, everyone is, can afford it and everyone actually can use it and still it is reducing the traffic, then yes, and every city in the world will agree. I'm not sure if this will really happen. This is just my thoughts, and I think you talked about this regulation, regulation, regulation. I think this is actually the issue. You have to think about that. You can answer immediately. Just about can technique be sustainable? I'm not sure if technique can be sustainable. Probably not. But the, the, the question is, do we need always technique? At the moment, the city of Vienna is investing a lot in social housing projects. Uh, Probably you know the city of Vienna owns actually a lot of housing and building stock. More than 50% of our inhabitants are living in buildings which are kind of co financed or owned by the city of Vienna. And we are investing in, in housing projects. And we are not investing in, when we talk about smart living, it's probably a very simple fact, which is not huge, which, which is the energy level is fair enough, it's quite okay, but it's a smart building. Probably it's not a building with tons and tons of technique because probably the people just don't need it. So I'm not sure, probably it's technique, well, it's not sustainable, but sometimes you just don't need technique to, to actually meet your goals. And the, your question about health and food, well, to be honest, there I do not have an answer. Um, it's just Health, yes, of course, health is there. We are totally aware that we have to find a way that people are healthy. That's actually a cost argument. But city of Vienna, is, we're not in that. We're not working that much in that area. At least I just don't know. I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> because. 
Thank you very much, all. Yeah, it's getting exciting. But please give them a huge applause. I, I think that your uh, still attention rate uh, as being it's exciting, but please take the excitement to the coffee break, otherwise you won't get one. The wonderful speakers, we have won't get one. I hope you can still stay a little bit and please engage with our speakers, have your coffee. We need to meet at half past 11 sharp here so that we can engage in the panel. Thank you very much. And how are you? Good to see you. Again, chair. Excellent. I'm just going to turn this off.